when I was presented with the idea of, of speaking and, and the topic was gratitude or Thanksgiving, obviously my first thought was Thanksgiving, the holiday itself. And I immediately said yes to the invitation, just on that basis alone. I do love food, but that's not the reason why uh, I said yes to the invitation. It's because I love history. I love American history. And there are two stories from American history that I think about probably every day. There was a joke going around, a viral joke about men thinking about the Roman Empire. I think about the pilgrims all the time. <laughs> I think about them all the time. And two stories, but I will just share one of those. And it relates to Thanksgiving. A lot of people have knocked Thanksgiving in recent years. They say, well, it wasn't like that, the history and everything surrounding it. That's that's not exactly how it was. And it's true. You know, there's a lot of embellishments, uh, over-exaggerations. But the actual history, the real history, um, is much more incredible, much more inspiring. And it's a story I think about almost every day. And it's the story of Squanto. And I actually commissioned an illustration uh, of him on my slide here in this presentation. And now the person who did this, his name is Paul, Paul Gallo. He's actually a, a missionary who served in Russia. I served in Russia as well. He went viral a few years ago. He did some chalk illustrations in Moscow of the plan of salvation and the tree of life. And those photographs just went like fire across the internet. And so he and I got in contact. And then I've commissioned him on a, on a few illustrations, and he made this one. So if you're, if you're interested in talking to him, his name is Paul Gallo, and he did this beautiful, beautiful illustration of Squanto. And the reason I love this story so much is because when Squanto was a young boy, he was kidnapped by a, a, an English ship that was passing by. He and a, a few other Native Americans in the area of, of Plymouth, what, what we now know as Plymouth Colony. He was kidnapped, taken aboard, and sold as a slave in Spain. And then eventually he found his way to London, to England. He learned English. And, and the record is a little vague about his, you know, how, what he did there and how he got back. But he did eventually manage to get his way, find his way back home after years and years and years. He had learned English. He had worked. He made friends. And there's, there's even the strong chance that he met Captain John Smith, but he made his way back home after all of these years of struggling. And he came home to, you know, where his tribe was. And after all these years of struggling to get home, he finds that all of his people are dead. All of them. And, you know, I, I put myself in his shoes just to try to understand you know, what he's thinking. I mean, he had, he had worked all these years to come back home and he's thinking, here it comes, here it comes. It's on the horizon. I'm about to be home. And he gets there and he says he, that literally there were bones of his, of his family and of his tribes people. They were, they were everywhere and scholars disagree, but, but they say it's a mixture of famine and plague um, that had wiped out the tribe. And so Squanto, I mean, just heartbroken, he joined with a neighboring tribe and lived with them. So they were some distance out. Well, a couple of years later, the Europeans arrived, right? The, the pilgrims, as we know them, they arrived in what we now call uh, Plymouth Colony. And William Bradford actually writes in his journal, he, he, he basically says that they built their community. He says, we came to this place that was already sort of cleared for us. You know, and he, he attributes this to God, but he says, he, he basically says the same thing that Squanto had noticed that there were all these bones of Native Americans that were there. He, and, and in effect, they're saying they're basically building on the bones, this graveyard, right? They built this colony there. And, and then they go into a winter that's really harsh. I mean, it's, it, it, if you read the, the accounts, it's, it's almost horrifying. And they were so nervous because they, they didn't know what was out there, really. They didn't know anybody and they didn't know what they were going to do. They had, they had built up some defenses and they were so scared of maybe Native Americans coming and attacking them that they, they built up these fake sort of defenses. So at night, it looked like there were guards standing with guns. 
And eventually, because so many people in the winter were dying, um, they would take the dead bodies and put them up, prop them up against the trees to look as though they were guards. But everybody was sick. Everybody was struggling. You had about 100 pilgrims that showed up. And then of the 100, basically about 50 survive. Right. And so it was it was a devastating winter. And then you have to put yourself into the shoes of these pilgrims. You think you're doing God's will and you show up here. And, and by the way, they were supposed to go to Virginia, not, you know, not New England They're, but they were blown off course. And so they end up in this completely random and extremely harsh environment. It's not where they were supposed to be at all. Not at all where they had planned to be. And, and then they were hit by, with this devastating winter and so many people had died. And you have to wonder, well, what, what is, didn't God want us to come here? Didn't God want us to do this? Um, and in the spring, a miracle happens. A man, a Native American, just walks right into Plymouth Colony. And they were so weak, they just couldn't, they couldn't even raise a defense at all, even though they were scared. A man walks in. And he speaks to them in very broken English. And that's that's like the last thing you are expecting to happen, right? You're in this strange new world and a Native American comes in and somehow knows English. And he, it wasn't Squanto, it was a friend of Squanto who had taught him these words. And he said, you know, there's a man who knows how to speak English and you should talk to him. And then Squanto comes into town such as it is, and then teaches the rest of them how to survive, how to live. And it is a remarkable story because, again, when you're putting yourself in the position of Squanto, here is a man who had everything, absolutely everything taken from him by people who looked and act and behaved like these Europeans, by and large, right? He sees another ship come with these pilgrims and he thinks this is happening all over again and you would think that his reaction would be one of extreme resentment say well just let them die my people died in that same spot let these people die but he doesn't and people have questioned his motivations they have said you know well maybe he he was a power play it was he wanted to get in the good graces of these people but they were they were dying i don't believe that at all they were dying it was him and him alone who saved the pilgrims they would have died without his help and so i i don't believe the idea that that this was a power play that he was trying to, to make alliances because another detail about squanto is that he did while he was in England, he did convert to Christianity. That's not a detail that they talk a lot about in the history books, but it is a verifiable fact that he converted to Christianity. And I, and I think about this, what, what he did and this, this blessing, how he came to them, how he brought them food, how he taught them how to live and how they survived, how they thrived. I mean, I'm, I'm a descendant of one of those people. I'm a direct descendant of one of those people who survived. And so many people are. I mean, he literally saved a nation by letting go of his resentment and offering what we now recognize as an as an act of thanksgiving, right? That's what it that's where we get that whole image is this idea. And at the end of the season, they all gathered together, these other tribes and people, and they all sat down together and they ate. And again, it doesn't look like what we imagine Thanksgiving might have looked like back then, but it was a huge step for a, for a colony that was so distrustful of, of the native people and for Squanto to do that, to let go of his own resentment and to help these people. It was a beautiful story. And it's one that we really should remember that we, and, and there's the scripture, those who are grateful will be made glorious. And so I'll, I'll read a, a great degree of my remarks come from really just this section of President Uchtdorf's talk that he gave in General Conference of April 2014. 
and it's called Grateful in Any, in any Circumstances. And it's this one quote. It says, brothers and sisters, have we not reason to be filled with gratitude, regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves? Do we need any greater reason to let our hearts be full of thanks unto God? Have we not great reason to rejoice? How blessed are we if we recognize God's handiwork in the marvelous tapestry of life? Gratitude to our Father in heaven broadens our perception and clears our vision. It inspires humility and it fosters empathy toward our fellow men and all of God's creation. Gratitude is a catalyst to all Christ-like attributes. A thankful heart is the parent of all virtues. The Lord has given us his promise that those who receive all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto them, even an hundredfold, yea, more. And I think about that quote in the context of this act that Squanto did. Again, a lot of people wonder about the motives. I don't. I see this as an act of thanksgiving, an act of gratitude, of compassion, of empathy. Like it says here, gratitude broadens our perception, clears our vision, and inspires humility and fosters empathy towards our fellow man. And I see that in this the story of thanksgiving. It's that, you know, we've got people in our family that we, we disagree with, but we sit down at a table together and we, you know, we, we forgive one another. We talk, we have food, we break bread. I wanted to share two more stories, and these ones are slightly more personal. There is a book that was published. I used to work at the Arbringer Institute, and they have a little-known book called Angels Among Us. And it was for years it was self-published. They would do this spiral bound, and you can see mine's pretty worn out. But it is a, a personal account of a of a woman who was an was an orphan after a war. She, they don't quite go into details here, but my understanding is that it was the Korean War, and and she was an orphan during that time. And so it's a true story, and she talks at, at great length in in the majority of the book about, um, like I mean, just like two thirds of the book about how horrible the conditions were in the various orphanages that she lived, and you read this and you go, how, how could this person walk away from this experience and not be angry at the life she had been given? Right. So, and she, and she makes that clear too, that, that it was brutal. It was difficult. And she had trouble not being angry at, at her circumstances, but I'll read to you a little section. She talks about going through various orphanages and she got to one orphanage and it became apparent to them that, you know, the business of that orphanage was to basically make money through adoptions. So it wasn't as bad as the previous orphanages she had been to, but conditions were still terrible. And she was, so all the kids in that were, you know, doing their best to be adopted. And whenever the opportunity arise, it would, would arise, um, they would all sort of clamber to be adopted. So I'm going to read a couple of sections from this, um, this book. I, I typed them up over here. She says, a local organization adopted our orphanage. They brought cake and milk on monthly visits to help us celebrate birthdays. So what she's saying is there was a there was like a charity organization that was outside of the orphanage that would just come and help these kids. So she said that they brought cake and milk on monthly visits to help us celebrate birthdays. In anticipation, each month we prepared a special program of dancing and singing. Every visitor was viewed by the children as a potential liberator. So these programs were lively and the actors were ever smiling and happy. The first day that the organization visited, however, I was sick and I sat alone in a corner. A woman in the group took notice of me and she came to my side. 
I don't remember whether she said anything, but I will forever remember what she did. She looked at me tenderly, took me in her arms, and held me. Now this may seem like a little thing, but to me, it was monumental. Even now, as I remember the moment, I relive its emotion. The true power of an embrace is known only to those who have gone a lifetime without being loved. And she goes on to say, a year after our initial embrace, my visitor embraced me as her daughter. So she was eventually adopted by this woman. One person caring deeply about me changed forever my belief that the world didn't care. Through her selflessness, my mother freed me from the greatest hardship long before she took me from the orphanage. She rescued me from resentment. But I was not the only one who was rescued. To hear my mother tell the story, so was she. She says that the orphanage saved her from the hardship of a complacent comfort. Nestled safely within her secure life without realizing it, she had built a wall between herself and others, and her life was poorer for it. But when she met the children of the orphanage, her wall came down. If the children didn't deserve their lot, it was unlikely that she deserved hers. The orphanage rescued her from the hidden arrogance of entitlement. Both the resentful and those who feel entitled are worried about what they think they each deserve. But when my mother and I left the orphanage together, we didn't feel deserving at all. We just felt grateful. And you see this, you see this dichotomy where it's on the one hand, you have gratitude, and on the other hand, you have resentment. And, and it's, it's so often that God will come in in between and, and invite you to do something. If you're feeling resentful, he'll invite you to do something that will save you from that resentment. And that's that story from Squanto where, where he, he had every reason to feel resentful about what he was seeing, what he had experienced. But instead, he took a different path and was very grateful. And you have the story of this mother and this orphan who had every right, this orphan had every right to feel resentful about her life. And this mother had every excuse to feel entitled to the life she had been given. But God stepped in between and invited them to live a different life. And they left that orphanage feeling grateful. There's a, there's a really touching line. I didn't write it down. But there's a really touching line in this book where she says, have you ever seen an angel? And she said, I have. She wore a t-shirt and jeans. And she would bring cakes for kids whose birthdays often went forgotten. <clears throat> So I'm going to read that, that Uchtdorf quote again, if I can pull it up here, just a, a sliver of it. How blessed we are, it, it uh, refreshed on me, how blessed we are if we recognize God's handiwork in the marvelous tapestry of life. Gratitude to our Father in heaven broadens our perception and clears our vision. It inspires humility and fosters empathy towards our fellow men and all of God's creation. Gratitude is a catalyst to all Christ-like attributes. A thankful heart is the parent of all virtues. The Lord has given us his promise that those who receive all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto them even an hundredfold, yea, more. Now, real quickly, I'll share just a personal story. You can pull up that slide. In that picture, you can see my wife in the corner, and there's three children. Two of those children, one standing in, in her pink outfit, that's my daughter, and then I have 
my son who's crawling on my wife's knees. So they're about two and one. And then the little boy that my wife is holding was our foster son, Lachlan. And my wife really wanted to do foster care for the longest time. And I agreed, you know, I was like, yeah, okay, we can do foster care. But I, I resisted it. And, but then we got a phone call and there was a little boy. They said, there's a little boy here um, at the office. And the, the exact words were, he has no one. Will you take him in? And I'll be honest, I was so hesitant. I remember my wife was leaving, going out the door and I said, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? Because we had two kids. We had a two-year-old and a one-year-old and we we're going to have this little newborn and it was going to be so many diapers to change. Like I just, I can't even emphasize to you enough how many diapers that is to change a day. It was a lot. And it's a lot of work to push that out <laughs> to, the, to the street. It was a lot. And I, I, I said, are we doing the right thing? Is this the right thing for us, for our kids? Is this too much? Should we be focusing on our kids? And I was really nervous and I started to get resentful because my wife is giving a lot of attention to this baby and I had all these other responsibilities and I had, we have these two other kids and I thought, oh, is this the right thing? Is this the right thing? But as time went on, my, my daughter, my son, I just fell in love with this boy, Lachlan. And I was... I, I I was pretty hesitant as a, as a father, just, I don't know. I don't know if this, this is just too much. This is too much maybe. Um, but I remember one day when, but he's about six months old, I went out into the garage and I was looking through some stuff and I found the bag that had come with him. They had brought a bag with him from the hospital and it had his name in marker written on it. It said Lachlan. I remember holding that bag and I just started to cry. And I realized how grateful I was to have this little boy in our home. And I didn't care how long it was going to be. I was just grateful. Just grateful. And then six months after that, we adopted him. And it's a picture of me crying. Like I, I cry at all, all sorts of things, as, you, as you've noticed. I cried historical stories. We adopted him in, in November of 2019. And he has added to our family, like it says here, um, a hundredfold, yay or more. In fact, after that, you know, we just felt so comfortable <laughs> fostering kids that we fostered another little girl whom we adopted. Her name is Mia. So we had four. So we have two biological children, and two adopted children. And we are currently fostering our fifth um, child and you know, fingers crossed and we love him, but my heart is filled, filled with gratitude, filled with gratitude for the invitation from the spirit to let go of my own resentments, open up my heart and uh, reach out to other people. And, and it, I, I testify to you that the Lord has given us his promise that those who receive all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious. This family that I have is glorious. And the things of this earth will be added unto them, even an hundredfold, yea, or more. And I testify that that is true. And I invite you to look at ways in which you need to reach out and help somebody in need. Because that's God asking you. It's God inviting you to have a more abundant, a more, a more thankful Thanksgiving. And I testify in that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.